Today's lecture content is about, and um, just to let you know about the field trip clashes, I understand that G102 and ES106 clash. I've spoken to Tolo, who's the coordinator of GE102, and he is happy for any students that are taking both to come on my field trip. And what he's going to do is provide an exercise for you to do on my field trip that relates to his course. But of course, if you want to take his field trip instead of mine, that's fine. I'll provide an alternative as well. So I'm leaving it up to you. Just if you do have a clash, um, let the lecturer know whose field trip you're not taking so they can sort out an alternative exercise. So today's lecture, we're going to continue talking about igneous rocks. This will probably be our last lecture that we're going to look at igneous rocks. We're going to move on to the different parts of the rock cycle. Um, but what we're going to do today is look at some different forms of igneous intrusions and lava flows. What do they look like in the field? What do they look like in practice? And how do they form? And this is where we get into the wonderful world of ge geological names. I remember being a student in high school, so about 13, and being next door to a classroom that taught geology, and just being completely confused by all these words that were coming out of the teacher's mouth that I could hear, and I just wanted to know what they meant. And um, there's just weird and wonderful names in geology, and we're going to see some of them today. So the main purpose of today's lecture is to look at the different forms of igneous shocks, and also how they relate to plate tectonics. Everything always comes back to plate tectonics. So, as you should know by now, we generally divide igneous rocks into extrusive igneous rocks. So those that form from magma that falls on the Earth's surface. Or, we talk about intrusive rocks, which is where magma falls and solidified underneath the Earth's surface. So, extrusive igneous rocks, so if you remember that's mainly lava, or rocks made out of pyroclastic sediments. So this is where we have material that's thrown out of the volcano and it eventually settles down on the ground and gets buried and forms rocks. Fire and plastic, that's what pyroclastic means. Because they mainly form under gravity, they either roll downhill if they're lava, these are some nice tons of lava from Kilauea, which is a volcano on Hawaii, or they settle out of the sky, it's really poor images, they tend to form layers. So we see these nice layers here. This is the Deccan Tracks in India, which for a long time we thought were responsible for the demise of the dinosaurs. These uh, numerous layers of basalt lava that once flowed down the slopes or flowed across the land near a volcanic eruption. And here we have layers of ash that settled out of, out of the volcano in the same year. So lava and pyroclastic rocks tend to form in layers. They're not necessarily continuous across the land, because as you can see here, lava tends to flow down valleys along the um, slopes of a hill, so you won't find any lava here, but you might find some here. But still, if you were to look here, you'd see layers of lava. And just to focus on lava now, um, because this is what we study when we're looking at geology in real time, um, there are lots of different types of lava, or different forms of the same type of lava. And a really nice one is called Hoi Hoi, which is a Hawaiian name. It means, I think, oh, actually, it means paddling or something. I can't remember. I'll have to check that. Um, and this is this really distinctive, it's either a smooth surface or it's this ropey texture. It looks like lots of rope piled together. And this lava, tend, this lava form tends to form when the magma is still really hot. The lava is still really hot. When it is cooling slowly. And distinctive to this type of lava is that it has this skin of cold and solidified magma on the top. And then the hot liquid magma flows underneath the skin. And the, realize, the reason why we have this like broken texture is because as this magma is flowing underneath the skin, it rumbles it up, it creases it. But it's really nice. And this is an example of a whole hurry hurry lava flow that's solidified and it's left behind these really nice rope textures. And these lava flows, when we see them as rocks, so they're no longer molten, they tend to have a lot of vesicles in them. So those trapped gas bubbles, because 
This skin prevents any gases escaping, so the gases stay within the lava. When it solidifies to form a rock, we get these really nice vesicles, which you might have seen in the lab if you've done your lab already. And they also produce really distinctive features as well. So you might even get things like lava tubes or lava caves. And these form when you have a holy holy lava flow. And around the edges, it's cooling more quickly than the inside of the lava flow. So these edges solidify, they crystallize, they solidify, creating this nice crust around the lava flow. The lava continues to flow throughout through this um, tube, if you like, but eventually that source of lava will run out. It will flow on, and then no more will be there to replace it and you get these really nice tube structures. So this is an example of a, a tunnel formed entirely by a huge lava flow. And this is, um, you can see the molten magma here, this is the molten lava, sorry, in this cave structure. These are all formations in Hawaii. And in my other life, before I became a geologist, I wanted to be an artist. Um, and this is a famous artist in Europe called Cesar Manri, who's also an architect. And he grew up on an island called Lanzarote, which is volcanic. So he grew up, grew up under the slopes of this volcano called Tidy. And he was fascinated with volcanoes. And he has he built his house entirely in lava tubes and lava caves. So this is his window. And he built it around a lava flow. You can't really see it there. Um, this is a lava tunnel, a lava tube, which he has in his house. And that's the corridor to his bedroom. And um, this is his outside area. And it's a museum as well as a show. And I haven't been, but I want to So another distinctive type of lava, um, a form that a lava might take, is called arc. Um, and this is very different to Hoi Hoi, which is ropey. It has this really blocky surface. So you have lava flowing in the middle, and then the surface is made up of these big blocks of solidified lava. And this tends to form when the lava is a bit cooler, so further away from the, um, the source, um, it moves quite quickly, um, but it's cooling very quickly, so it breaks into these big um, blocks. And it has this really rough, jagged surface. Um, and one of the re uh, ways you can remember R is if you imagine you're going for a hike through Hawaii's uh, countryside, you come across an ancient hurry very flow, that's quite easy to walk over. If you come across an ancient R flow, and you go R, because it hurts your feet. That's the way you remember it. So if you see um, an ancient R flow in the rock record, um, you tend to see these very fragmented blocks of lava um, in another lava matrix, whereas the hoi hoi, you don't see that. So you might have seen this in the lab already. I've already described flow lava to you. So where lava erupts underwater, it tends to form these really bulbous, pillow-like structures. And they cool very, very quickly on the outside, so they tend to have glassy exteriors, and the inside cool a little bit more slowly, so they can form microscopic crystals. So this is some that are forming today. This is an ancient cliff of ancient pillow lavas, and sometimes, you can't really see there, so you can hear, see here, this is a cliff that has been eroded. So we've now cut through, our, we're seeing a cross section of our pillow lovers, and you can see these nice bulbous um, structures which are squashed at the bottom and rounded on the top, giving these really nice features. So you might have this really fine-grained or glassy outside to the pillow lava, a more crystalline inside, but still only microscopic crystals. You might get vesicles in here, so trap gases, and you quite often get these radial joints. So as the magma cools, it contracts, so it forms these cracks. And those cracks, those joints we call them, always form about 90 degrees from the cooling surface. So that's why they're in that shape there. We'll see these on the field later. And another really spectacular um, formation.
formation produced when we have lava erupting and solidifying. It's not found everywhere. We can see it in some places in Mitty Levin. It's called columnar jointing, so columns. And it's found in many different lava types, but mainly basalt. It can sometimes form when you have very, very shallow intrusions under the ground, but it's most typically um, typical of lava flows. And it's where you get this regular pattern of polygon, polygonal columns, so columns with a polygonal cross section. And these are cracks in the rock. And again, they're formed when you have a lava flow that cools very evenly. The cooling rate across the lava is very even. So it's usually quite consistent thickness across the lava flow. So you have very regular cooling spaces, cooling centers. And as that magma cools, lava cools, it contracts slightly. And sometimes, if it cools in a regular pattern, we can get these nice hexagonal shapes. And the scenery produced by this is often spectacular. You can see here these beautiful columns, uh, hexagonal um, prisms. And here is a beautiful waterfall in Iceland. And the rock is formed exclusively of basalt that's got columnar jointing in it. And there's a really famous example, if you're from Europe, um, called the Giant's Causeway. So this is in Northern Ireland. And it was believed in mythology before people understood what this was. Um, because you have these huge areas of basalt, with this columnar jointing, that go right out into the sea. And on the other side of the sea here is Scotland. So it was believed that the giants um, that lived in Ireland built this, started building this path made out of paving stones um, to try and get to Scotland. That was the mythology. But it's really spectacular. So now we're going to talk about intrusions, so our intrusive igneous rocks, and what form they can take. So just to go through some terms that I'm going to use, so if I talk about an intrusive body, or an intrusion, they mean the same thing, it's just a general term for the intrusive mass, uh, which is made up of an intrusive rock. When I talk about country rock, I'm talking about the surrounding rock. So when you have magma, that intrudes into the crust, the surrounding rock that it intrudes into, we call the country rock. And these are two other terms you should be familiar with by the end. If you have an igneous intrusion that is parallel to the layers in the earth, we say it's concordant. So in English, con means with, it comes from, I think, Latin or Greek, means with, so it's with the layers. If you have an intrusion that cuts across any layers in the earth, we call that discordant. And our igneous intrusions can be divided into concordant and uh, discordant uh, bodies. So the largest type of intrusion tends to be formed very, very deep in the earth. And the generic name we use for these very, very large intrusions is called a pluton. And I don't know if any of you are interested in space exploration or the debate about whether Pluto should be a planet or not. And there was a case a couple of years ago for renaming Pluto Pluton. And all the geologists in the world went up in arms because we already have that term, so they can't steal our term. It means something else to us, um, but they didn't in the end. But yeah, it's a generic term for very, very large igneous intrusions at depth. They could be a few cubic kilometers or even much, much bigger. And we can actually see them and study processes that happen deep in the Earth if there's been uplift of the Earth's crust and everything above it has been eroded. So it's a very, very good way of studying the inside of the Earth is we see these protons exposed on the surface. And there's a very famous um, Fijian plutonic group called the Tholo Plutonic Group, which we'll see on the field trip, which is exactly that. It's igneous intrusions that have since been uplifted and eroded down, and they make up a lot of the highlands in the southwest Fiji. So, batholiths are the much the, the biggest type of fruit on the map. They form very deep in the earth, generally in the mountain ranges, and they're at least 100 kilometers cubed. That's a big cube. And above those magma, uh, these huge batholiths, you get smaller bodies, 
and we call them stops. We generally see that term known. Batholith is the only real distinction apart from that one in practice. It's these very, very large igneous intrusions on a day. So how do they fall? So whenever you get magma forming deep in the earth, it's under great pressure because of a crust overlying. But it's still a lot lighter, so more buoyant than the surrounding crust. So it'll always try and reach, uh, rise up. And as it rises up, what it does is it wedges open cracks, existing cracks in the crust, or it might form its own cracks because of the pressure it's exerting on the crust above. And gradually as it forms those cracks, magma will rise up into them and force them apart, and it can rise further and rise further. So that's one way that these magmatic bodies can rise up in the crust and form. As it rises up through the crust, it breaks off parts of the country rock, and eventually they fall in the magma, and some of them melt. And one of the reasons that the, this magma can rise and melt the country rock is because if you remember in the very first few lectures, continental crust in particular tends to be more felsic than oceanic crust. So if you have a big pluton formed of continental crust, if it's slightly more mafic, it will have it will be able to reach higher temperatures than the crust melting temperature, these felsic melting temperatures. So it will melt the country rock. So these are two other ways it rises through the crust, it breaks off blocks of country rock, it melts them, or it melts the surrounding crust. And sometimes when it breaks the bro blocks of country rock and into the igneous intrusion, those blocks are preserved. And this is a really nice example, so you've got a man, the scale, and this is a big igneous intrusion with a block of a foreign type of rock in it. And another one here. And the egg is starting to melt around the edges, but it's still preserved. And you've got this nice little surrounding layer, which has obviously been altered because it's been heated, it's essentially been cooked. This minerality has changed, but the block has been preserved. And that's an example of a zenith. And this is evidence that intrusions break off parts of the country. So batholiths, which I just mentioned, they tend to be the deepest form of intrusion. They have big blob-like structures, and what they actually do is they feed other types of these intrusions. So rather than the whole mass rise up, there's always going to be parts where it's easier to break through fractures in the crust or melt the crust, and that will subsequently feed other magma chambers and these intrusions higher up in the crust. And I keep on talking about Yellowstone, but it's one of my, oh sorry, Yosemite, I read the wrong one. Yosemite National Park um, in the US is one of the most beautiful places on Earth, and this is all a batholith that's been uplifted and eroded by glaciers. And I keep showing the photo, but I, I will keep showing the photo. So now we'll talk about the smaller types of igneous intrusions, so sills and dikes. So these are smaller than most plutons. They're long, they're sheep-like, so um, they might be a lot thinner in this way, but they might go on for a long time in terms of sheets. Um, but they're a lot smaller than most plutons. They could be anything from meters or centimeters to kilometers there. And this is where those terms discordant and concordant are important. So sills are concordant. These run parallel to the layers. So this is an example of a sill here. You can see it almost looks like it's pushed the layers of the crust apart and the magma is intruded into it. And if that layer solidifies to form igneous rock and igneous intrusion, we see it in the geological record as an igneous intrusion parallel to any layers in the crust. Whereas a dike, this is discordant wherever we see dikes. They cut across existing layers. And what they tend to, how they form, is that if the magma is trying to rise, they might find a crack, or they might cause the earth's crust to crack, and they, the magma shoots through it over time. So they take advantage of existing cracks in the crust, or they 
produce their own. And often you find the two together. So you might see a duck and then a sills radiating out of it. Some more examples. So here are some sedimentary layers. And we see, if we look closely, you can see this rock's made out of crystals. We know it's an igneous rock, but it's parallel to the layers, so we call it a sill. And the same in this situation. Whereas a dike cuts through layers. And this is a nice example here where the dike is made out of a more resistant in, uh, rock than the surrounding country rock. And so it's more resistant to weathering, and so it protrudes out of the landscape. And a really nice thing about these images of trees is I don't know if you can see here, but either side there's a slight change in colour of the country rock. When we do our metamorphic lectures, you'll know that if you change the temperature of a rock, you might cause the minerals to change, because different minerals are stable at different temperatures. You might get the same ingredients of the rock, but they'll rearrange their crystal structure um, to be more stable at higher temperatures. So where you get these igneous intrusions, you get what you call baked margins, which is where the surrounding country rock next to the intrusion has been altered. The minerality, the colour, the texture has been altered, and that's because it's been heated up. It's the same process as of cooking. You change dough into bread by heating it. It changes into a different um, arrangement. And the same with dikes. And conversely, on the edge of the intrusion, it will be much finer grained than the middle because it's cooled more quickly. We call that a cooled margin. So how do we distinguish between, say, a lava flow, which is also an igneous uh, body that lies parallel to the bedding because it flows over the bedding and then it gets buried? Well, lava will only have one baked margin, right? Because it flows, it's got air on one side rock on the other. So if you see a rock like this, with baked margins on either side, you know that it must have intruded into the crust and not flowed over it. Also, they tend to be coarser grained because they're not extrusive. And you don't get any of those weird pyroclastic textures or vesicles or hoey hoey structures. It can be quite tricky though. So I'll now move on to dikes. So these are the ones that are discordant. They cut across the layers. They often feed volcanoes. And this is my, another one of my favourites in the US. The US has some spectacular scenery. Um, forget the cities. Don't go to the cities. Just go to the um, national parks. This is an extinct volcano, which has since been eroded in the desert. This is an aerial view. We call this ship rock. And quite often, you might be able to see here, volcanoes fed by swarms of dikes that radiate outwards. They feed magma to the volcano, and as that volcano grows old and becomes extinct, any material solidifies, and we get these nice dikes left over. Again, these have been eroded much less than the surrounding rock. And as you can see here, they radiate out from that central volcanic flow. We call those the feeder dikes. And uh, Nick Mollet, a professor at the university, sent me this photo of a dike in Australia, Northeast Bay, I think. Um, I don't know where that is. Um, and as you can see here, you've got layers and layers of um, sandstone. This is about 250 million year old sandstone. This is a layer of coal. And you can see that there's a nice dike. And in, something you'll be doing later on in the term is creating stories. So looking at a cliff like this and creating a story about what happened to the earth to form these structures. So you'll be doing things like deciding which came first. Which came first, these sediments or this dike? Well, this dike cuts across the sediments, so it must be younger. So your story would go, um, we have a beach, because we might know that this is a beach deposit, depositing sand, more sand accumulated in the beach, the beach environment. Then we've got our coal, it must have been a swampy environment on land, so a delta maybe. And then these were all very formed rocks, and then magma intruded through. That's your archaeological history. And I've already introduced planes um, when we 
we talked about minerals, but around all of these aqueous intrusions, because every magma contains a certain degree of water. So that water, hence, as the magma cools, the water's left over. The water doesn't like going into the magma. So you get these waters, very hot water, um, surrounding these aqueous intrusions that have lots and lots of dissolved minerals in them. Because hot water can dissolve more um, stuff in it, more ions. This hot water is also under pressure, so it forces its way outwards around these intrusions. It either takes advantage of existing cracks or it forces its way out in, um, by cracks because it's under pressure. And as that water cools away from the igneous body, it can no longer keep those minerals in suspension, so it precipitates them. And you get all of these, we call them veins, after the veins you find in your body, um, filled with minerals. So this is a nice example of um, a sedimentary rock filled with quartz veins. So there, there was once hydrothermal fluid, so hot fluid running through these cracks. It cooled and it precipitated its minerals. This is a gold vein. And the rock I talked about when we talked about igneous textures, so um, a pegmatite, which is an igneous rock with incredibly large crystals in it. Those large crystals form very slowly, also from a water-rich magma, um, and they tend to form around these igneous intrusions. The water's left over. Any magma tends to be water-rich. It forces its way out into veins, and you get this pegmatite vein, very, very large crystals. But we don't really call these igneous intrusions, we just call them things. And there are lots and lots of other fantastic names depending on the shape. You have something like this, an upside down, upside down mushroom, we call it a lopolith. And these are really important. I talked about chromite deposits in South Africa for collecting heavy minerals through fractional crystallization. The other way around, if you have a mushroom shaped intrusion, see one here. With a feeder dike, we call it a lap of it, but you can go on forever with these things. Well, I don't know if I have, I think I have time. I might not have time. So, for a long time, geologists were looking at igneous processes, so studying volcanoes, um, studying shapes of igneous rock in the landscape, um, but they didn't know why certain areas had more of them, why certain areas had igneous rocks. In the crust, but they don't have any um, lavas extruding anymore. And this, the discovery of plate tectonics really brought everything together because it explained the distribution of igneous um, rocks essentially. And it also enabled us to look um, at the rocks in a certain landscape and in, make an interpretation and say, we see these rocks here, so we know now that there must have been underwater eruptions because we see flow lavas. We know that because of that, that we must have either been on a hot spot or we must have been at a subjection zone, which you don't just get lavas forming anyway. So we can use our Sherlock Holmes head and interpret these igneous intrusions and extrusions in terms of previous plate tectonic activity. So there are three main places where we get igneous rocks forming. So mid-ocean ridges, or divergent plate boundaries more specifically because they can happen on land as well. Subduction zones, these are our divergent plate boundaries where plates are moving apart. Subduction zones where plates move together and one plate subducts into the other. And mantle plumes, so this is where we have, in the middle of a plate maybe, a plume, a pop, rising mantle, um, reaching the surface or reaching the crust and producing that. And I've, I've talked about these before, but just to summarize, I'm going to go through them one by one. So where we have oceanic crust, we have oceanic crust like all over the South Pacific. And one piece of oceanic plate subducts against the end of the other. The older, colder plate will subduct against the other. We produce a lot of mafic rocks. We've got a thin crust here. So a lot of this basalt makes it to the surface. There's not much distance to travel, but we also get intermediate comp uh, composition rocks as well, because you'll get some magmatic differentiation down here, forming more silicic rich mantles. 
an example given here is in Indonesia. So where's that? Over here, there are subduction zones all over the South Pacific. There's also a huge subduction zone here um, by Indonesia. If you're looking for your practical with this plate, subducting under this plate. Producing igneous processes in these volcanoes. Our spreading centers where two plates move apart. Because the crust is so thin here, we're producing partial melting of a mantle. It doesn't have much chance to differentiate into different types of lava, so we mostly get muscle. Um, an example given here is Iceland. Again, hotspots, they happen under the oceanic crust. They tend to form basalt. They don't have much time to change into more um, felsic or intermediate compositions. We do get those as well, but they're not as rare, not as common. Whereas if, if you have ocean plate colliding with a continental plate, this magma down here has more of a distance to travel through the thicker continental crust. It has time to differentiate. It's dying. Um, and so you tend to get maybe an intermediate and maybe even felsic. So I'll go through those in turn. So at our mid-ocean ridges, so plates moving apart here, our beautiful, spectacular mid-ocean mountain chains. What's our input material for our igneous rocks? It's the upper mantle here, so it's partial melting of the upper mantle. What's the process forming that magma? As I mentioned in previous lectures, as this hot mantle rises and these plates are pulled apart, the pressure on this rising mantle is reduced. You reduce the melting temperature, you produce partial melting of the upper mantle. Those bits of uh, magma will then rise and collect in a nice magma chamber. And the output is the formation of new uh, oceanic crust and the bottom part of the lithosphere. Corresponds to the upper mantle. I'll go through that in detail. So here we have our plates moving apart, pressure release on the upper mantle, hot mantle rises, decompresses, and partially melts. Those tiny droplets of magma rise, they come together to form this magma chamber, which is a mixture of crystals and basalt magma. As the plates are pulled apart, a crack forms here. So some of this magma rises to fill the gap. And based on our shapes of our igneous intrusions I've already talked about, we can call this a dike. It's a long, sheet like but thin igneous intrusion. And this erupts on the seafloor surface to form pillow bars. And the whole seafloor. If you were to peel away any sediment that's accumulated, you'd see the ocean floor is covered in pillow lavas. We drill through the crust, we see pillow lavas everywhere. But as this material eventually solidifies to form a dike, a solid dike, but as the plate is pulled apart, another dike can intrude in the middle. Because as that initial dike is pulled apart, some material goes on this plate, some material goes on that plate, so more magma can come out in the centre and form a new dike. And that process is repeated, so you have a layer of sheet, we call them sheeted dikes, which were initially here, but have since been moved this way. So if we're going to drill down through the crust even further, maybe we find pillow lavas, and then we see layers sheeted dikes, which initially represented this initial rift valley. What happens down here, so the magma chamber roughly stays here, so as this lithosphere is pulled apart, the edges solidify, they're underground, so they're intrusive, they cause slowly, so they form gabbro. If you remember from the last lectures, gabbro is the coarse grained equivalent of basalt. So basalt is the extrusive 
rock formed from a mafic magma. Gabbro is the coarse grained rock formed from a mafic magma. So we have this mafic magma chamber crystallizing slowly on its edges as the plates are being moved apart and this part gets cooler and it solidifies. So if we draw down further into the oceanic crust, we find pillar logs, we find cheated dikes, and we find gabbro. And as these big plates move away from the spreading centre, they collect sediments. Where does that sediment come from? It might be made up of tiny dust particles that have blown off the continents, settled out into the oceans, and settled down on the ocean floor. It's actually mainly made up of, of the shells of microorganisms that float around the oceans. So these are my favourites. I keep mentioning them, and I will keep mentioning them. They're called foraminifera. And a lot of the oceans are covered with a beautiful sounding rock called an ooze. And ooze is a sediment made predominantly of the shells of microfossils. That's a close up thing. And, as we'll find out later, any rock that's in contact with heat can change its mineralogy, so you actually get some metamorphism of this gap around here. A slight alteration because of the And because we're underwater here, there's a lot of water circulating through this crust, which has lots of cracks. And because there's a heat source down here, you get seawater filtering through the crust. It's heated because of this deep heat source, which makes it rise. It makes it dissolve minerals, because as we know, hot fluids can dissolve more minerals. But then it hits the cold seawater again, and it precipitates those minerals. In the divergent plate boundary lecture, I talked about black smokers. This is where these hydrothermal fluids meet the cold seawater again, and they precipitate tiny, tiny particles of minerals, generally sulfite, and they produce these chimneys of uh, horrible black, stinky smoke, but it's not smoke, particles, which we found out now are hosts of incredibly diverse ecosystems. So the basis of the ecosystem are microbes that feed on sulfite. They don't feed on organic matter, they don't feed, they use sunlight to photosynthesize, um, they feed on sulfite. And then there's all manner of organisms that are part of the food chain higher. And you can see some of those beautiful tube worms down here surrounding the bed. And finally, from last week's lecture, I told you that quite often in the magma chamber, higher temperature minerals, so mineral, minerals with a higher crystallization temperature, may start to form as the magma chamber cools. So in this case, you might get crystals of olivine. It's a very high temperature mineral. It has a crystallization temperature of 1200 degrees or so. Crystals of olivine might start to form. They sink through the magma, and you tend to form a layer of very olivine-rich rock at the bottom of this magma chamber. So when you drill through the crust, you find pillow rollers, sheeted dikes, gabbro, and a very, very olivine-rich layer. And a rock that's rich in olive oil, we call it a peridotite. It's very easy. And actually, a convergent plate boundary, so where you get one plate subducting under the other, sometimes, if you're lucky, parts of the ocean crust can be scraped off onto the land. And so we can see sections of oceanic crust on land. And before we were able to drill through the ocean crust, these they confused us at first. We saw, we saw these cliff sections of layers of pyridotite, so olivine rich rock, followed by gabbro, followed by sheeted dikes, followed by pillow lavas, followed, followed by sediments. And we didn't know how this could have formed because this was pre plate tectonics. And we found these in quite a lot of places. We find them in Japan, we find them in Cyprus, we find them in quite a lot of places around the world. Since we've been able to drill through the ocean crust, and since we've been able to do these lab experiments, um, we can hypothesize or conclude, whatever, whichever word you want to use, that these, we call them ophiolites, are actually sections of oceanic crust that have been scraped off with subducting plates and moved on land. So moving on 
onto a different type of plate boundary, our subduction zone, where we have one plate subducting under another plate. So what's our input material? This is a real mixed bag. Okay, so you might have melted sediments that came down with the subducting plate. And they'll have a very, very different melting temperature to the plate itself and the mantle down here. So the main input, so you've got sediments coming down with the plate, the crust, you've got the plate itself, you've got the upper mantle here, and then any matter that rises to the crust might incorporate parts of that crust with it. So you've got all manner of um, source materials here. So it's a real mixed bag. What's the process? that induces igneous or magma to form. It's fluid-induced melting. I've talked about this before. I'll come on to it again. So any water in this plate that subducts underneath the other will be squeezed out. It'll mix with the overlying mantle, reduces melting temperature, this magma. And the output material our magmas have incredibly varying composition. So here we have our subduction zone. We should all learn how to draw all of these features. So we've got our upper mantle, our crust, this together is our lithosphere, subducting under another oceanic plate, for instance. So we have sediment grains. Between those sediment grains, we have a lot of water. And actually within the basalt, at the top of the crust, there's also a lot of water because there are cracks everywhere. So as the pressure and temperature increase, we can't really let the water release. But as the temperature increases and the pressure increases, the vapor pressure essentially means that the water can be squeezed out. It rises. It causes the sedimentary rocks to melt, and it rises into the upper mantle, which is the important bit. And it causes melting on the top of the lower overlying plate and the upper mantle above it. As that magma rises, it joins together to form magma chambers. As these small magma chambers grow together, it can form an even bigger magma chamber. Which, if this was to solidify, we call it an apolith, and then they can feed other magma chambers above. Because of magmatic differentiation, you can produce one magma of one type down here, and you can erupt a quite different type, because it might have melted parts of this crust, it might have had fractional crystallization occurring in the magma chamber, and so we can have a few different lava types. And the final example is just our plumes, so our hot spots. So we have this incredibly hot material at the core mantle boundary. It rises up, it meets the crust. Because of decompression melting, it causes melting of the upper mantle and it produces magma. And depending on whether this plume is under a continental crust or oceanic crust, we get very different types of magma produced. And sometimes, something that I'm really interested in, I talked about the Deccan traps in India where you have vast, vast um, areas covered by kilometres upon kilometres of basalt magma. We call these areas flood basalts. It's literally where basalt come out of the crust in such high volumes that it covers huge areas of the Earth's crust. We don't see them today, but we find huge areas of the Earth's crust covered in huge volumes of basalt. So these, this is just a map showing where they are distributed. So this is a 250 million year old um, flood basalt called the Siberian Tract. And as you can see, it covers a huge area. And it coincides with one of the largest mass extinctions ever, or the largest mass extinction ever to occur on Earth. 90% of life was um, wiped out. Forget the dinosaurs, this, is, this was much more serious. And a lot of people have linked the eruption of these flood basalts the atmospheric changes, climatic changes, um, may have led, up, led to life nearly being wiped out. It's called the end Permian mass extinction. And we have numerous other flood basalts around the Earth. And a really famous one is 
called the Hong Kong Java Plateau. It's found in the South Pacific here. And I told you that oceanic crust is typically about seven kilometers thick. Here, in the South Pacific, it's maybe 30 kilometers in places. And that's because at some point, there were huge, huge, vast areas covered in lava, building up over time. And it's hypothesized these also are caused by mountain plumes formed in the crust, because they're not on plate boundaries. And this is actually really important for Fijian history, if I come to on the field trip. But as you may know from the practical, there's a subduction zone here, which Tonga lies on. So one plate is subducting into the other, and you have a volcanic island arc forming Tonga. Fiji used to sit on that volcanic island arc. But what we think happened was, when this plate got subducted so much that this huge, thick piece of On Tong Java Plateau met the subduction zone, it couldn't, it stopped it subducting. So in this northern part, instead of continuing on the subduction zone, we pulled this part to twist over and it moved Fiji away from the subduction zone. That's what we think. But there'll be a lecture on that later in the semester. So just to summarise today's lecture, there was a lot to take in, um, and a lot of terms to take in. But basically we covered a lot of the structures. We might see, we'll see a lot of these on the field trip, so these names are quite important to learn. So we looked at a few different types of lava. We looked at the fact that pyroclastic rocks form in layers as well. And we also covered different shapes and sizes um, of appears in the tree. We learned names such as plutons, cells, and dikes, not to mention veins, pegmatites. And we also recapped on how magma forms and how you can generate these different types of intrusive igneous rocks and extrusive igneous rocks at different plate boundaries and the different types of processes that form that magma. So I'll leave you there and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank uh -huh.